none of us are perfect and that includes in wildlife photography. In this video I've picked out five mistakes I definitely used to make and maybe sometimes still do. Number one is not putting a memory card in the camera. I know you're thinking this is just so obvious and it's a stupid rookie mistake but this is something that I did occasionally do um, and I've done it at least once in the last year. Twice. More than twice. It's one of the worst feelings in the world when you turn up to a location and maybe you've got something planned and it's a really exciting subject and you go to take the picture and it says can't do it, computer says no, no card in the camera. It's a really horrible feeling and not one that anybody enjoys. What I do now is to make sure I put a memory card in the camera the night before I'm going to go out. So even if I'm going to go not particularly early the next morning, I'll still put the memory card in the camera and make sure everything's planned and ready the night before, kind of as a safety precaution. And the second thing I started doing, probably about two years ago, was just to have a backup memory card and keep this in the glove compartment of my car. If I realise out in the field and I haven't got the card, then I can go back to the car. Obviously it's a problem if I'm quite far out in the middle of nowhere, but if I'm not too far from the car, then you know, maybe I can nip back and I can get that. So it's kind of a little extra backup and I have used that definitely at least twice for sure. And maybe even have one in the coat if you have a regular coat that you wear. Just put a little memory card in there, put them in the case so they're nice and safe. The next one is I never really used to put my settings into the camera until I started photographing. With wildlife photography, your opportunities can be so fleeting that I think it's good that you already have some idea of the settings you're going to be using and lock those into the camera before you arrive. Similar to the memory card, I try and do this the night before or at least when I arrive on location before I start shooting. So before basically I get in that situation to photograph the subject, I'm going to be aiming for a fairly high shutter speed. That's probably fairly standard, but there's other things I might want to set depending on the light. Time and time again it happens, a lot of you will know with wildlife photography, particularly opportunistic style, you might just be walking to the location and something will happen, something will appear and fly by. If you need to start filling around with your settings to get the shot, then you might miss it. If they're already locked in there to some degree, then you have a much better chance of getting that opportunistic picture. Number three was that I never used to really wait long enough for the subject to do something. And I think that's so important in wildlife photography and developing your own photography. So what I used to do, I'd, I'd have an opportunity, say for static portraits, and I'd take my time in trying to get the perfect picture. So I'd try and get it as sharp as it could be, try and get the exposure absolutely bang on, uh, try and get the composition perfect as well. And then a lot of the time, I'd probably you know, be happy with that, and then I'd move on. And there's nothing wrong with trying to get a perfect picture like that. Um, but you can capture so much more uh, of the spirit of the animal and get such more of an impact in an image if you can photograph something a bit different, a little bit of behaviour or maybe a pose that just shows more of the personality of that bird or animal. So I try now just to wait longer, I try and have the mindset not to take lots of pictures but to you know to get one really really excellent picture and if you wait long enough something will happen birds and animals are very similar to humans in many ways if you wait long enough you will get that opportunity and uh, it will do something interesting maybe it's going if it's a duck for example maybe it's going to take a bath uh, if it's going to splash stretch its wings those are fantastic photo opportunities if it's an animal maybe it's going to suddenly open its mouth and start yawning these are all things that will happen if you wait long enough and I think this is a great way of making common subjects more appealing. If you just keep taking the same shots of those common subjects that people have seen thousands and thousands of times, they're, they're not really going to get much more attention. But if you can do something a little different, just capture that bit of behaviour or maybe a quirky pose, it just instantly makes it different. I think grabs more attention from the viewer. So it's really the, the thing of quantity no, it's really the case of quality over quantity and I would much rather have one really, really excellent shot that I'm happy with than 10 average ones. The next one was not using the screen on the back of my camera, which is kind of an embarrassing one, but it's true. Um, for a long, long time, I just used to use the display on the top. So on my camera, I've got that top display and I've also got the screen on the back and I can see a lot of information through the viewfinder, the exposure information anyway. Um, so I just used to use the top. I don't know why, I just preferred it. I didn't like using that back screen for some reason, but there are some benefits of using that screen. So the main one is that you just, you don't need to keep kind of popping your head 
head higher up. So if you're photographing wildlife, a lot of the time you want to stay pretty still, certainly in certain situations. And if you have to kind of lift your head up to, to look down at that top display, that's not ideal. So if you just use the back, you can kind of keep your head more behind the camera, which is really useful. This is, I think, particularly useful if you're uh, photographing lying down, where you need to keep that low profile. So on my camera, I can use the, the Q menu. So on the back of the screen, I just press the Q button, and then it brings up all the information. Pretty much everything, I think, is in there. Even white balance, frame rate, everything. I I can do there from the back of the camera absolutely perfect and the other thing is it's really useful if you're working in a hide if you're photographing from a hide sometimes it, you know it can be quite dark in there at times and just having that really bright display on the back makes it much easier number five is to do with your autofocus area or zone and the mistake that I think I made was keeping all of those options enabled in my camera now it's going to be very similar I'm sure on lots of cameras to mine you're going to have different options for how much of an area you can use to focus. So you'll probably have just one square, a very small area of focus, and then other options to expand that to use more focus points. Now, I found, and it's still the case now, that I, I pretty much only use two, maybe three different types of autofocus area. So I'll use a single focus point a lot of the time for my photography, and then I'll use a, a more expanded area with a few more focus points around the center, usually for moving subjects that are against the clear background. So what I found was, because I was only using a couple, two or three of those, uh, but I still had to cycle through to select it, so I'd go in and use couple of buttons and then cycle through to select the one I wanted um, because I was not using many of them it was a waste of time cycling through them all just wasting time so I disabled two of them uh, so I disabled the what's called the spot focus because I, I don't really think there's much difference between that and the single square and then one towards the end I didn't see much difference so I disabled those um, so that means that now when I cycle through it's not taking as long to go through them but I've kept the the end one which is all 61 points I hardly ever use this but I've kept that in there as an option just in case I get a situation where there's a say a very very fast moving bird against a blue sky for example and I might switch to that but thinking about it I might actually take that out kind of as my as my default setting um, so definitely play around with that if you find so if you find that you're not using certain autofocus zones areas ever you never use them then just disable them because it's wasting your time cycling through and every second counts in wildlife photography Did you used to make any of these mistakes I've talked about or maybe you still do and you're honest enough to tell me in the comments box below. Um, all of these things are generally pretty good on now but we're all human, we all make these mistakes from time to time even forgetting to put a memory card in the camera. Uh, if you're not subscribed please do subscribe for more wildlife photography tutorials and have a look at this video as well if you want to learn more in particular about autofocus. Thanks for watching, I'll see you next time.